desk full of crap opening shot just so happens to be full of things that will relate to the plot of this game. Which makes no sense because Nate and Sully have no idea yet that what they're searching for will take them to the Middle East. Which is what all this stuff on the desk alludes to. And don't tell me this isn't Sully's desk. Who else smokes cigars in this game but him? Once again, an Uncharted game begins with a quote from a famous adventurer. Even the last two Tomb Raider games had enough creativity to make up their own opening quotes. This opening shot manages to cram nearly every single cliché there is for London. Pubs, billards, dartboards, chavs, flat caps, and red telephone boxes. Only thing they're missing are the Royal Guards and Big Ben. Incidentally, those clichés are pretty much all I know about London. I don't get out much. My apologies. One can't be too careful. I'm guessing you're Talbot. Mr. Sullivan. And Mr. Drake. Previous Uncharted games kept their British villain count to one. In this game, every villain is British. You could crew the Death Star with this game's cast. This ring is a plot device in nearly as many games as the One Ring was in movies. Sully, this is fake. I assure you, Mr. Drake. Oh, you are right. This is phony as a $3 bill. If you were going to use counterfeit British pounds, you might not want to use the older version of the 50-pound note, which isn't even accepted anymore. You're a thief. And you aren't? And Talbot just walks off stage left and disappears until later, even though the exit is behind Nate and Sully. <laughs> Quick, hit him! I don't care how big you are, a bar stool broken over your head is going to have an effect. And if it doesn't, then the punches Nate used to bring him and all other big guys down with later aren't going to affect them much either. Apparently this game takes place during the Great Balding Epidemic of 2011, since every Brit we meet who isn't Talbot or a woman is bald. Get him! I'm not sure if these guys on the lower floor were part of the setup or not. Their dialogue would suggest otherwise. However, they don't sound nearly chav enough or drunk enough to start a pub brawl over spilled drinks. Big guy slams Nate head first into a urinal and then rather than capitalize on his advantage, waits patiently while Nate recovers and gets to his feet. Breaking that light did not change the lighting in this room at all. I get the feeling Nate would lose this fight badly if this guy would only attack Nate rather than stand there and take his punches like he's Ronda Rousey getting her ego adjusted. We just beat up two whole floors of goons, but four guys in an alleyway? That's just asking too much. I mean, one of them even has his arms sternly crossed. Kate? Still wallowing in the gutter with your protege, I see. Not very dignified for a man of your age. Should have known you'd be behind this. Just once in this series, I want to see a new character introduced with a who the hell are you, since apparently Nate and Sully know everyone to some degree. Oh, careful now. Wouldn't want you to melt. Cute line, but it's not raining in this alley. There's a sound effect for rain, but no actual rain effects. When did Nate tie the ring back around his neck? He grabbed that off the pool table, then started fighting, and has been fighting ever since. At no point did he have an opportunity to put that around his neck. Give me that back. Oh no. Oh, shut up. And you didn't use that gun earlier because... Well, it's the third game in a series inspired by Indiana Jones, so I guess it's only appropriate to have a level with a teenage Nate that shows us how he came to meet Sully and get Francis Drake's ring. Oh no, the museum keeps their display cases locked. How could I have known? Nate sees Sully walking around the museum and immediately assumes he's up to something. Normally I would only assume Sully is there to hit on the museum attendants. Not steal the same ring I want to steal. Inserting a blank key into a lock will in no way help you cut the key correctly later to match the tumblers. I don't speak Spanish, so I have no idea why this guard is throwing Nate out of the museum, but I assume it's because he didn't pay the entrance fee. However, there was no one at the door to even take money, and there's no way this guard could have even known that Nate didn't pay if that's the case. A stealth tutorial happens when Nate has to sneak past some dangerous fruit salesman. Normally I'd send Nate for eating this apple and looking like an asshole. However, I think he was set up to look like an asshole here because that was the only apple on a table full of bananas. I see that the guy who paints climbable ledges with white paint found a more environmentally friendly solution by training birds to perch on climbable ledges. Let's try that again. Sully can speak Spanish. He was translating books written in Spanish back in the first game. So why didn't he understand Nate here? Hell, I don't even speak Spanish and I know what pendejo means. Other Spanish words I know include puta and papi, which probably tells you what kind of videos I learned Spanish from. The technique is really sloppy though. You're telegraphing all your moves. How? Most of the time that he was telling you, he was on the rooftops. The only time Nate could have telegraphed anything was when he lifted your wallet. And you didn't even notice that until he'd already done it. You even complimented him on it. My wallet. Fine. Maybe we'll just call the police. Go ahead. Of course, they might wonder why a middle-aged tourist is following young boys down alleyways. <laughs> In Colombia during the early 80s, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't care. In fact, I'm pretty sure that was on the travel brochure. 
And even if they did, Sully just has to tell them that you stole his wallet and when they search you, it'll pretty much settle the situation since you're the only one carrying incriminating evidence. Nate never removed the key from Sully's wallet, so how did he slip it out without Sully noticing when he gave him back his wallet? I understand that Nate is supposed to be good at sleight of hand, but this is stretching it. Unless Francis Drake had some incredibly fat fingers, that ring would never stay on. How does a silver ring power a decoder wheel? Why did Sully even need to make a key to unlock the case if Marlowe and her men could just walk right into the museum and take the ring and decoder anytime they wanted? Marlowe apparently stationed men in all the buildings surrounding the museum on the off chance that there was a need to chase someone across the rooftops. <laughs> Landing on a table like that from that height means that all the terrible things that could happen to your spine just happened to your spine. <laughs> Nate commits the first of what will be an impressive kill streak over the course of his life. Just close your eyes. This won't hurt a bit. Game thinks I don't notice that's Nolan North playing a bad guy about to create a time paradox by shooting Nate whom he voices once he grows up. Agent Smith was for once not able to dodge a bullet. Suppose you tell me what's so special about that ring. It belongs in my family. I'm just taking it back. Passed down from Francis Drake himself. If you already knew that the ring was Francis Drake's, why did you ask what was so special about it? I don't know how to break this to you, kid, but Drake didn't have any heirs. No children. Apparently everyone in the Uncharted universe knows Francis Drake's biography by heart, since Elena said the same thing back in Uncharted 1 when Nate told her his name. I'd have to look that trivia up on Wikipedia. The nuns sort of insisted on it. Ah, so like a boarding school. That's a nice word for it. How do you grow up an orphan in Colombia like Nate has and not develop even a hint of Colombian accent? He was hiding something. Something big. How big? Like secret mission from the Queen big. Like millions in plunder treasure that hasn't ever been recovered big. That big? That big. And that decoder has something to do with it. I would bet my life on it. Oh, swell. And Marlo's got it. Won't do her much good without the key. If this ring and the treasure it leads to are so important to Nate, why did he try to leave it on Francis Drake's corpse back in the first game? I see great things in our future, kid. I've decided that after a five minute conversation with you. Um, they're gone. All right, lads? What was Nate and Sully's plan if Talbot had tried to pay them with real money? Their entire plan was to piss off Talbot, fake their deaths, and follow him after he took the ring. At no point did Nate have time to switch the real ring for the fake one. The one Talbot inspected was the real deal, and Nate and Sully had to fight their way out of the bar after that, and then they were captured in the alleyway. There was no reason for Nate to sneak into this building to open the shutter from the inside for the others since the latch wasn't even locked. Marlowe's car just so happened to leave tread marks on the only four spots where the hidden switches are located. Did the driver try to impress her by pilling out in place? Sully, aim your beam at the wall. Like headlights. <laughs> How would you open this secret door during the daytime when headlights would be overpowered by natural sunlight? Just be ready for anything. Might be a quick exit. No doubt. She's the best driver in the business, you know. And yet, we've never seen her drive a car or make a getaway. Hell, in the last game, she was more well known for having a great ass rather than her driving skills. I'm not interested in your excuses. He was a loose cannon and you should have known. Yes, it is regrettable, but not regrettable. Sloppy. Marlowe and Talbot waited until they got all the way back to their underground base before discussing Cutter shooting Sully and Nate, like they couldn't have had that conversation during the car ride here. If all it takes to activate this decoder is a silver ring with some Latin inscriptions, I think you could have made a replacement 20 years ago, since that wouldn't really be too different from the key Sully made to open a museum case. Finally, Drake's secret will be revealed. What is this? Just try flipping it over first. Maybe it's like a USB stick. You men stand guard and stay alert. We may have been followed. You, come with us. Find them and bring me that ring. Do all of that, but don't bother putting the decoder somewhere safe. For the third game in a row, all the information Nate needs will be found laid out on a desk. Rather than use the ring and the decoder in the middle of the base that's currently crawling with enemies looking for you, why don't you just put it away and use it once you're somewhere safe? Ah, uh, it's... long hidden. What? Shush! No shit long hidden, are you kidding me? No offense mate, but your ancestor was a right asshole. Not to mention bad at keeping things hidden. It's a clue. It's gotta be something hidden in this room. It does? Why? That message was written hundreds of years ago. There is no reason for you to believe it has anything to do with anything in this room. So, wait, if Drake was on a mission from the Queen to find this place, why all the secrecy? I mean, it looks like he went to a lot of trouble to hide whatever he found. 
even from Her Majesty. After what happened with Francis Drake in El Dorado, don't you think you should at least be wary of anything else he wanted kept hidden? I think the guy earned the right to be taken seriously after that. Also, it bears mentioning that if Francis Drake wanted the Pillars of Aram to remain hidden, he probably shouldn't have left behind the decoder, ring, and map that all lead to the Pillars of Aram, which is the exact same shit he pulled with El Dorado. I can accept there being unexplored ruins in most places, but a 400-year-old chateau in eastern France? This place should be a tourist attraction. How exactly did Marlowe's men know to come to this chateau in France? They never got to use the decoder, nor did they see the map. There is no explainable reason for them being here. Because if they knew about this place before, why hadn't they ever come here to get the amulet piece? There's some sort of message written here in a knocking script. This time, the table is the information Nate needs. The altar guards the entrance to the underworld. You decoded all of that by turning to just two letters? Medieval Minesweeper. <laughs> that guy was standing right in front of Nate, so I find it hard to believe you managed to line up a shot so perfectly as to only wing Nate's arm while they were struggling. One, there's no species of spider this big, and if there were, they certainly wouldn't be found in France of all places. Second, spiders are solitary creatures. They don't swarm like ants and chase after people. Apparently spiders suffer the same crippling weakness as vampires and can't enter direct sunlight. I think it goes without saying that Nate and Sully surviving this burning chateau deserves five sins all on its own for the sheer amount of times the floor and ceiling collapses on them. I gotta say, I'm losing the plot here. Sully would be good at game sins. Nate, these guys are playing for keeps. Yeah, so? What, you're just gonna roll over for them now? Nobody's talking about rolling over. Then quit acting like you're ready to lay down and die. This scene happens in every single Uncharted game. The only difference is which character is arguing with Nate and which side of the argument Nate is on. Listen, kid. I've had your back for 20 years. I'm not going anywhere. Except for that time in Uncharted 2 where you did skip out after just one level. All the days when you could fly to Syria from France just a day and when this archaeological ruin would still be a tourist attraction rather than a pile of rubble. So I guess I'm sending real life here for being worse than a video game. We sneak in. We find out where they're holding Chloe and Cutter. If they're holding them. Glass half full, Sully. I'm just saying, these guys don't seem like the hostage-taking type. They're also not too keen on murder either, as we've seen, since they were going to let both you and Nate live after getting the ring from you back in London. What happened to you two? We've been trying to reach you for over 24 hours. Oh, right, I need to top up my minutes. You're using a prepaid phone? Mate, those contracts are a complete ripoff. If Cutter's phone was out of minutes, Nate would have heard a voice message about the phone no longer being in service, which would not normally make you assume someone has been kidnapped or killed. I've got it all in here. <laughs> all important information will be found in the middle of the book cliché. But they were all part of some sort of hermetic secret society. The British Occult Secret Service, the School of Night, the Hellfire Club, the Order of the Golden Dawn, they're all connected. Where exactly did you get this journal that explains pretty much everything about the secret order Marlowe and Talbot run? Before you were asking just who these people were. Now just two days later, you pull a diary out of your ass that has all the answers. We cut to the goddamn chase, please? Yeah, we really need to keep moving. What exactly is the pressure to keep moving here? Why can't the other characters speak their opinions? It seems pretty important. <laughs> So their plan was to ambush Nate in this narrow stairwell, and while one of them held Nate, the other would throw a grenade at him? Did they draw straws to see who would hold Nate down for this? Also, Nate survives a grenade going off right in front of him in an enclosed space, and is in fine enough shape afterward to grab hold of a chain to stop himself from falling. This vertical cover segment brought to you by Dark Void, a game everyone else forgot about except for Nolan North, who voiced the protagonist for that game as well. Um, guys! Yeah, just a minute! Rather than yell about the incoming RPG, Chloe uses the always descriptive, GUYS! What the hell's wrong with these guys? Nate, you destroyed an entire city. You have no room to talk. It's all clear. They survived this. They survived that too. Also, where did that RPG come from? The moon? Talbot manages to drug and brainwash Cutter just a few feet from where Nate and the others are standing. Which just makes me wonder how Talbot planned for this. Cutter was the one with the journal, and if he had joined the others, Talbot wouldn't have had an opportunity to drug him. He's gone. How in the world? It's called bullshit, Sully. Since even if there was a secret entrance he used to escape, there's no way Talbot could have known about it since he's never been here before. No one ever found this secret entrance in all this time. This place is a tourist destination, by the way. Drugs can be punched out of someone's system. Here we have yet another example of beams of light pointing to a location on a map. It's like they can't even help themselves anymore. Also, this was a lot of effort someone went to to make a globe. Yeah, yeah, all the same. I think I'll hold on to this one. Why would you let the guy who was drugged and brainwashed into nearly killing you hold the amulet piece? You let him have a gun too? Losing one weapon in a cutscene means you lose all of your weapons. Cutter, pull the trigger. My pleasure. Great job tricking your friends into dropping their guns so you could take a shot at Talbot. You could have at least winked at them. Talbot took a bullet to the chest a moment ago. Where's the evidence of that? Hand it over. You don't know that Cutter has anything to hand over since you never saw which of them was carrying the amulet or that they even found it. Talbot isn't wearing an earpiece, so I have no idea why he's pretending to get a report about something. You could just shoot him. I mean, why did your men even bring gas cans up here for anyway? Charlie, don't. Shit. Shit. No. 
Yeah, I'll just stand there and burn horribly. What? Don't move! Don't move! Jesus, my leg! Don't touch it! It's broken! I'm surprised someone finally broke a leg from falling in one of these games. No one tries to stop them as they steal this tour bus. That was too close. It'll be okay. No, I mean the whole thing. It just isn't worth it, Nate. Let this one go. And here's this conversation happening yet again. Fuck. If you let these bastards win, after this, I will never bloody forgive you. And so Cutter's role in this game ends, since his voice actor had to go play Dwalin in Peter Jackson's Hobbit movies, which are ironically also about a magic ring. This screen wipe effect brought to you by Star Wars. Elena is introduced as first, and I can't help but notice that she's still sporting Nate's half-tuck look. Elena just happens to be in Yemen for some reason, just like she happened to be in Nepal in the last game. How you doing, sweetheart? Oh, no. Sorry, that's sort of frowned upon here. So is not wearing a burqa, but you didn't let that stop you, and later at the end of the game, you have no problem hugging Nate at this very same airfield. You two can hold hands, though. Actually, no, that would be even more frowned upon, as then it would likely get them arrested. Nate, you're still wearing it. I, yeah, I am. <laughs> It helps in this part of the world. Nate and Elena have apparently broken up yet again in between games, just so they can get back together in this one. This market sells the hookah pipes, but not the dank kush you would use it for. Is somebody gonna fill me in here? Who are those guys? And what does Charlie have to do with all this? He was working with us on this one. Wait, what was? He's not dead. No, no. Him and Chloe. Wait, Chloe too? Yeah, but they both bowed out when Cutter broke his leg. Wasn't Sully supposed to fill you in on all of this while Nate stole the journal back from Talbot? It looks like we stumbled right into our secret entrance. Well, that's our girl. No, that's plot convenience. It's in a knocking script. Must have been left by Drake. Can you decipher it? The moon will show the way. There are over a dozen Anakian characters on the wall, and you only deciphered two of them. I'll make a note of it on the map. You're gonna mark up Sir Francis's 400-year-old map? Lady, that's pretty tame compared to some of the other pieces of history he's already destroyed. Hey, you think you could remember this? Oh. Yeah, but we ought to copy it down, don't you think? Uh, no, I really don't recommend that. Really? Because making a rubbing of the first amulet you found in France is the only reason you're here right now since Talbot stole it from you. Giant wall of Necronomicon. Won't budge! Maybe I can open it from the other side. All three of you could fit under that door easily. Either someone on the development team has seen some shit I never want to experience, or none of them have ever encountered a spider in their lives. Okay, so, so let me get this straight. Drake sails thousands of miles looking for this Atlantis of the Sands. And when he gets this far, what he finds here is enough to make him turn around, sail home, and hide all evidence of his voyage. Right. But you, you're gonna keep going, aren't you? <laughs> uh, yeah? Why don't you just remind him of El Dorado and why Drake wanted to keep that hidden? Why would anyone just ignore Drake's warnings about something when he tried to keep a zombie virus hidden? Listen, you won, okay? You've outsmarted her. And here's the third time this conversation happens. You know where to find the city, and Marlo doesn't. Why can't that be enough? You met Nate while searching for El Dorado. At some point, I think you have to learn to accept your boyfriend's hobby. Sully doesn't stop Nate from running away after he's been drugged, even though he saw what happened with Cutter. I suspect I know you better than anyone, Mr. Drake. Of course, that's not your real name, is it? And we're just gonna move on from that little fact without alluding to it ever again. Mother commits suicide. Father surrenders son to the state at the age of five. Entrusted to the St. Francis boys' home. Strangely, Marlowe doesn't mention the fact that Nate has a brother, even though we know that to be the case in the next game. <laughs> it's all so Dickensian. You are so English at this point, you might as well end your sentences with an impromptu singing of God Save the Queen. Don't worry. She's of no interest to us. Unless, of course, we need to apply a little pressure. She's of no interest to us until she's of interest to us. Five minutes of bizarre chasing. Nate breaks a board over Talbot's head and it barely phases him. This guy breaks one just like it over Nate's head and it knocks him out long enough to transport him outside the city. Aram of the pillars. <sighs> of course. Where is it? You're just a local pirate that Marlowe hired to get rid of Nate. Why would she tell you about Aram of the pillars? <laughs> Was that chair made of balsa wood or something? Why doesn't anyone ever shoot Nate when they had the chance? Every single villain is given the opportunity to easily kill him. This Poseidon Adventure inspired level with a sinking upside down cruise ship is worth taking off five sins alone for being one of the best levels in any game to date.
I'm starting to get the feeling that I'm watching a Final Destination movie at times with all the things in the environment that nearly kill Nate. Was there any reason for Nate to go back inside the sinking ship? He was already on the outside hull. A single piece of driftwood keeps Nate alive all throughout the storm and while he's unconscious. And he also washed up on shore right outside the city he was captured in. None of these people on the beach thought to help the unconscious man lying face down in the surf. Elena uses a Blackberry. This scene with Nate trying to catch a plane on foot that's about to take off when Elena drives up with a jeep to give him a hand is exactly the same as the scene in Uncharted 2 with the train. Even the reason for Elena being in the jeep is the same, with Nate telling her earlier to get out of here. Hell, the plane even crashes just as most of the train did in that game. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm getting Uncharted 2 flashbacks. Nate stood away on the plane under the front landing gear. After a three-foot crawl through a maintenance tunnel, Nate is at the back of the plane by the cargo hatch. Rather than throw him out of the plane, you could have just used that gun to shoot him. Also, that's another instance of losing one weapon in a cutscene means you lose all of your weapons. Nate's murder boner is so strong he risks killing himself in a plane crash just to kill one guy he already beat up. This plane is not high enough in the sky to depressurize like this from a hole in the hull. Hell, the cargo hatch is still wide open. Slamming into a crate in mid-air at terminal velocity means you are either dead or very dead. I gotta think. Keep my head. I'll just head to the wreckage and see what I can find. There's some water. Nate doesn't bother to check the intact crate he rode to the ground for supplies before heading out into the desert with no water, even though the plane was carrying nothing but supplies for Marlowe and her men. Nate navigates his way through the desert by using the stars to guide him toward Ubar. However, Nate didn't memorize the star chart back in Yemen. He had Sully do that, so Nate shouldn't be able to figure out which direction to go in. Oh, shit. It's a ghost. Nate upgraded his oh crap catchphrase to the PG-13 version. After two and a half days in the desert without water, Nate should be near death, not able to have a shootout with Marlowe's men. Deus Ex, uh, hell, I'm not even sure what to use here, but it's Deus Ex Machina nonetheless. He imprisoned them in a vessel of brass and cast it into the depths of the city. Iran became a place of evil, cursed by the tormented spirits of the Jinn. The English must not reach the city. If they unleash the power of the Jinn, we don't have much time, do we? Nate has come a long way from Uncharted 2, where he didn't believe in curses and dangerous lost cities until he saw why with his own eyes. But they have the greater numbers. We cannot attack them in the open. Tonight, rest. Tomorrow, they enter the canyons. We'll take them there. So because they have the greater numbers, just the two of us will ride up to them on horseback in the open and attack them. But it will be in a really, really cool way, so it's all right. Suddenly, I'm getting the last Crusade flashback. Oh yeah, I already did that one. This is a shortcut. Just stay with me. It's a shortcut that goes in the same direction as the people you're chasing, and is in fact the only way you could even go. And it doesn't even help you close distance, just the elevation. No matter how ridiculous the idea of attacking an armed caravan with just two guys on horseback is, I don't care because this level is awesome. Sometimes the rule of cool just trumps logic. Though I can't overlook why the drivers don't just stop the convoy and kill Nate and Celine rather than keep driving. <laughs> The driver of that truck couldn't have swerved to the left to hit Nate instead of running over his own man. Man, straight ahead! Into the storm? Are you sure you know what you're doing? Trust me, Drake! Trust me! Salim! Drake, where are you? Salim asks Sully and Nate to trust him as they ride into a sandstorm, only to be separated not even 30 seconds after entering it. Maybe you shouldn't put such blind faith into the guy when he doesn't bother explaining what the plan is and why you should follow along with it. Hopefully this will be the last time I have to sin a game for having such an easily discoverable lost city until Uncharted 4 comes out. Irama the Pillars is a huge city in the middle of the Rubicali Desert. Supposedly no one has ever found it because of a huge sandstorm that covers it. However, I'm pretty certain that an endless sandstorm would attract enough attention on its own to get people to come here and discover it anyway. Nate doesn't listen to common travel advice and drinks the local water. And many balls were trid because he did. What you say? I'm glad that Sully isn't actually dead, but how did he get all the way down here to the underground water source ahead of Nate? Also, why didn't he try to stop Nate from running off when Nate started hallucinating from the water? The last time Nate was drugged and Sully let him run off, it led to both of them being captured. I saw them shoot you. Right after the eclipse. What? What eclipse? Look, kid, you went nuts right after you drank from that fountain. It's the water. That's what destroyed the city. Not the wrath of God. The whole water supply is tainted with some sort of hallucinogenic agent. Must have drove everyone mad. That's what Marlowe and Talbot are after. The drug that Talbot currently has seems to be pretty effective at controlling enemies already. So why do they need a new drug that does the same thing? So you reckon that's why Elizabeth and Dee sent Francis Drake out here in the first place? Yeah. It wasn't treasure they were after. It was power. Only once Drake realized what he'd been sent for, he abandoned the mission. 
He lied to the queen, told her he didn't find anything, and then hid all traces of his voyage. Except that he didn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be here right now. Well, I sure as hell got us outnumbered. Let's, uh, let's split up. Try to flank him. Yeah, better odds that way. I see no problem with this plan. There is no way that jar contained enough hallucinogenics to contaminate an entire city's drinking water, and any drug it released into the water supply would have dissipated centuries ago. Destroying this one building causes the destruction of the entire city. This is why we can't have nice things. Sully knows dank internet memes. This isn't exactly the One Ring, and Marlow isn't exactly Gollum, and this isn't exactly Mountain Doom. But damn if I'm not getting Return of the King flashbacks. No! No. No! No again. After the past two games end with bullet sponge boss fights, Uncharted 3 ends with a fist fight against a decently developed villain. It only took them three games to pull that off. It took Sully way too long to help out in this fight even though he was standing right above them. Deus Ex this guy again. By this point, Nate has destroyed so much ancient history, I'm surprised he's not on trial in The Hague. Didn't you say something earlier about men and women not being able to hug in this place? Prepaid phone? Mate, those contracts are a complete ripoff. 